Will here bringing you a kooky, spooky, but weirdly plausible theory about Interstellar. Pass me that tinfoil hat and grab one for yourself too, because we are going weird. Because as far as the sci-fi genre goes, Interstellar is just about the perfect film. It's got everything from an awesome, gripping plot, fantastic visual effects, memorable dialogue, strong characters, and a healthy sprinkling of love. Although that whole thing about love being an interdimensional quantity it went a bit over my head, but you know. However, the one thing the film could be said to be lacking in is a villain. Sure, Dr. Man tries to mess things up at one point, but he's much better defined as an emotionally unraveling space loony than an actual villain. Sure, you could argue that the plot doesn't need a villain, but what if there was one? One that was right in front of you all the while, only to pass completely unnoticed. Of course, given that the villain isn't one that is explicitly portrayed as such in the film, we need to examine the setting, context, and facts presented to fully unravel the bad guy. So let's break this down and see what we can find. So with that in mind, I'm a slightly ill will for what culture, and here's a film theory on the evil mastermind you didn't notice in Interstellar. Number 6. Commercialism is dead. No one buys stuff they don't need anymore. One of the most poignant lines from the film is, we didn't run out of TV screens, we ran out of food. An idea very much in line with the views of environment crusaders who warn against the dangers of over-exploitation of resources that increasing commercialization brings with it. In the film, society seems to have learned its lesson. No one buys stuff anymore, neither do they buy into the idea of buying stuff they don't need. Everyone has realized what a bad idea endless greed was, and gone back to a simpler, minimalist lifestyle. For a world that is set in the future, there is a conspicuous absence of modern gadgets and advertisements from the setting. It's a world where both technology and capitalism have peaked and then been discarded. Remember, there is mention in the film of sentient machines being used in the marines, and there are several examples of powerful pieces of technology that are no longer in use. The rejection of such vast hordes of technology, as well as an entire way of life, makes you wonder what happened to all the guys who used to make millions from selling stuff to people before the commercial bubble burst. Have they given in to the new societal order, happy to be forced into an agricultural existence, or are they just lying low, organizing and scheming, and trying to come up with a plan to make money off people again? Number 5. The film's version of NASA is a cult-like fringe corporation with no obligation to work in public interest. Now let's get to NASA. The NASA depicted in the film is very different from the NASA we know. Far from being a widely respected authority figure on science and space, NASA in Interstellar is a fringe cult. So fringe, no one even knows if it exists. So fringe, people who chance upon it by mistake are tasered, tied up, and questioned by robots. They're essentially a tight-knit community of select group of scientists who still believe in a future powered by technology. They're also effectively a secretly funded corporation at this point. They have at their disposal cutting edge technology that is eons ahead of anything available to the general public, but they don't run on public money anymore and therefore shouldn't have any interest in catering to public needs. They obviously operate with the backing of the government, whose interests they likely cater to. If they're operating on private funds, that makes them answerable to private investors. Both of these factors are problematic in context and are going to be very important later on. Which leads us to number 4. NASA are the only ones who are saying Earth is doomed, and they are experts at lying and manipulation. Let's examine NASA's statement that the human race won't survive on Earth. First off, everyone except NASA seems to be very optimistic about things getting better on Earth with time, effort, and making the right decisions. How much can we trust an organization that isn't obliged to address public interest with something so directly related to public interest? Let's take a look at NASA's honesty count in the film. First, they use Cooper's natural curiosity against him from the start, asking him for his words to pilot the shuttle before so much as telling him what their great plan is. Their plan, in the form that they explain it to him, of course, is a huge lie. They never planned to save all of the population on Earth, or even a part of it, something that is later made explicit in the film. That's right, they lie to the very guy who was meant to champion their cause and save mankind. Not only that, they manipulate him into going on the mission by asking him to consider the future of those dearest to him, his children, without which he'd never have agreed. No matter what the greater cause is, this sort of lying and manipulation is just pure evil. 
exactly the kind of strategy that a pushy salesman selling you a fraudulent scheme is likely to use. Number three, plan B, which was the real plan all along, made absolutely no sense. We later find out that Dr. Brand always knew the gravity equation is unsolvable, which means plan A, getting everyone off the planet in a ship, was a no-go from the start. That leaves plan B, getting 5,000 human embryos to the new planet and let everyone else on Earth die. Consider for a second how crazy this plan is. The current human population in the timeline of the film is 6 billion, as Cooper points out. There's a lot of people currently being supported by a planet that NASA will have us believe is doomed to the point of impending human extinction. The setting in the film looks far from a post-apocalyptic society where sh** is going down in a major way. Kids still go to school, there are still baseball games, and people in general are dealing with life minus a few privileges. Are we to seriously believe that at least some humans won't be able to survive on Earth and repopulate it? Even if we believe that agriculture is going to be affected on every single place on Earth, our species were hunters and gatherers to begin with. Many such primitive societies still survive. How exactly does life stand a better chance of surviving if we spend billions on sending 5,000 babies under the exclusive care of NASA's machines to a new planet that will need to be terraformed first, rather than ensuring a small population of humans survives on the planet where we are already surviving, you know, for significantly less cost? It's either another blatant lie or an eyewash. But to what end? Number two, NASA's real plan to sell interstellar travel to the rich and powerful. So if the situation on Earth isn't as bad as it's being made out to be, why are NASA so bent on convincing everyone that it is and finding a new habitable planet? Well, because it's their brilliant get rich again scheme. They want to mint money from the possibly large demographic that is annoyed about how boring and dull things are going to be on Earth for a very long time. In the scene that the film begins with, we see numerous screens fitted into yards in what is later revealed to be a space pot, with elderly people talking about how boring and dull it used to be on Earth when they were growing up. What purposes do these messages serve, and more importantly, how did these people live to be so old on what was supposed to be a dying planet running out of food? They look an awful lot like commercial advertisements, don't they? The space pod itself is shaped like a bubble, a bubble that the mind-bogglingly rich can exist in. There's no way NASA were going to send 5,000 embryos to be brought up by robots. There will need to be an adult population, and who are the adults who would get to go? Obviously, not regular chaps scientists, politicians, sponsors, YouTube presenters, and anyone else who's necessary for society to function. And then, the incredibly rich as well. Imagine how much a chance to be a pioneering settler population on a new planet would sell for. Imagine how much power these people would hold there amidst a bunch of babies and machines. Technology that was dead and buried on Earth would be back in business big time for those who are leaving it. In fact, they'll have to rely on it for everything. This would give enormous power in the hands of people who own that technology. That's NASA and the people who've been funding them. Meanwhile, back on Earth, they're probably going to aggressively market a fun, non-dusty, technologically advanced future on another planet, and people from all sections of society will increasingly give in to the greed of accumulating enough resources for their tickets to a brighter future. And before you know it, the same structures that ended up screwing humanity over will re-establish themselves. Number one, the brand versus man metaphor. If you're still not entirely sold on this idea, consider the metaphor based on the names of two very important characters in the film. The head of NASA is called Dr. Brand. He's selling a brand, an abstract concept, an idea of trust for people to buy into and keep pouring resources into. He's a ruthless individual who will lie and manipulate to serve what he perceives is the greater purpose. The other guy, who is also hailed as a hero for most of the film is called Dr. Man. Man as in human being. Dr. Man is seen as a genius, the best of us. He buys into the concept Brand sells him and embraces it. He falls for the lure. But when he's out there on the deserted planet on his own, he realized he'd gotten more than he'd bargained for. In his own words, he says he never expected the planet he went to to not be the one with a promise for life. When he realizes the full gravity of what's going on and what the really important things in life are, he gets into a frenzied state and tries to return, but sadly, it's too late. 
It's striking symbolism for the constant struggle between commercialism and the individual that plays out in our real lives, and what might well be the theme for the secret hidden subplot in Interstellar that you never noticed. And there you have it folks, a kooky but hopefully interesting and plausible theory on the real evil masterminds behind Interstellar. Feel free to drop this video a like if you enjoyed it, and feel free to swing on by that film theory for more of that scrumptious cinematic speculation, courtesy of our very own Jules and Ash combination. In the meantime though, why not drop a comment with your own thoughts on this theory? Maybe you think it's amazing, maybe you think it's total Either way, it's always interesting to hear what you've got to say. I've been Will for What Culture, thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you next time.